first time that I'm uh, giving this presentation here on uh, the study and prevention of mass atrocities. I'm in Germany also a member of a board at the foreign ministry that deals with uh, crisis prevention and I've prepared uh, two years ago a paper on uh, atrocity prevention for the foreign uh, ministry of Germany and try to uh, lobby for the uh, establishment of an atrocity prevention board at the uh, foreign ministry similar to the atrocity prevention board that was established in the United States under President Obama. My main concern is that um, mass atrocities happen and uh, we see them, we witness them and nobody reacts. Um, because the five permanent members of the UN Security, Security Council have no interest in um, preventing mass atrocities or they are involved themselves and so we don't get a decision, a consensus among the five permanent members. And what can you do then? Um, are we helpless? Should we just deal with the consequences of mass atrocities? And the second concern is that, um, let's say, um, after the turn of the century, we had a normative change in international relations uh, in favor of um, the responsibility to protect R2P. Called. And the UN General Assembly even adopted a resolution in favor of the responsibility to protect in 2005. And everybody thought um, we have now a shift in, in the norms of international relations in favor of protecting affected people and no longer only states. So that we have a shift from uh, a state law to a law that protects civilians. Um, but we see over the last 10 years especially a return to a prior paradigm. So far less protection, far less responsibility pr to protect than maybe um, in the immediate aftermath of the 1990s. Okay. Uh, I want to deal with uh, basically four uh, questions in my presentation. The first is about definitions um, of violence, definitions of mass atrocities. How do we recognize is there an atrocity going on? Second, theories of violence. How do mass atrocities relate to theoretical explanations of violence, to the logics of violence? Uh, the third, are there certain escalation patterns that we can discern that certain precursor violence may end up in mass atrocities? So are there certain patterns where we can say if we see that it's likely to end up in mass atrocities? And the final part will be about policy recommendations. Okay, so the question here I'd like to raise is how to anticipate mass atrocities. Um, what are good predictors? What are good indicators to say, okay, there is um, a mass atrocity looming uh, behind the horizon? Um, how do we recognize it? Because it's often denied. So the perpetrators say this is fake news, or this is just invented, or this is part of an ongoing war. Um, this is not a mass atrocity, it's part of, of regular warfare, or so on. Um, how could we delegitimize also mass atrocities? Because often we see that um, atrocities are legitimized. Um, so um, basically say, you know, the victims were actually the perpetrators, they have committed themselves certain crimes and therefore they deserve the punishment and so on. So we find all kinds of legitimizing strategies uh, uh, by the perpetrators against the victims. Um, so, uh, how can we then also contribute to the delegitimization of, of mass atrocities by saying, you know, we, we have to name the perpetrators, we have to blame them, we have to shame them, we have to raise moral noise. How can we prevent it also? So even if we recognize mass, uh, mass atrocities, uh, could we do something about it? And what are the policy instruments and tools? And finally, if a mass atrocity happened, how can we punish the perpetrators? How can we do justice to the victims? Okay, let me come now to the definition of mass atrocities. Um, it started maybe the uh, um, 
definition of atrocities um, committed during uh, war with the Hague Convention in 1907 that first defined violations of the law of war. So that pertained to first forced labor, to abductions, to mistreatment of prisoners, uh, to the deliberate destruction of towns, of cities, of villages, and so on, of, uh, to the hostage taking. Um, only after World War II, the Geneva Convention um, said you know, uh, there should be punishments uh, for committing these kinds of violations of the law of war. Then a Polish, Jewish, Ukrainian lawyer was the first one who um, uh, defined genocide. And he was uh, crucial and also informing the Genocide Convention of the United Nations. His name is Rafael Lemkin. And uh, he said um, that um, a, a genocide is, uh, is uh, the attempt to destruct the uh, foundation of, of the life of a national group um, with the aim to annihilate the group itself. Um, so it is uh, an attempt to undermine the very existence and the foundations of the existence of a whole people. Okay. When we uh, now talk about mass atrocities, um, there's some overlap with this um, definition of genocide, but there's also some difference. Because mass atrocities can be defined as the deliberate actions of armed groups um, that result in the death of at least 1,000 non combatant civilians targeted as objects of violence over a period of one year or less. So we don't have necessarily a genocide. So genocide can be part of mass atrocities, but also goes beyond. Why 1,000? Because in uh, political science, many began to um, say, okay, there must be, in order to make quantitative comparisons, somehow a breaking point. We have to have a certain definition where uh, a new quality uh, sets in and um, um, violence below 1,000 um, deaths per year uh, caused by war uh, are then not uh, treated as mass atrocities. And there is some arbitrariness in this definition. Why should 999 not be called a uh, death, uh, called a mass atrocity? And what happens between all those that say that uh, we have cases where you have 25 uh, uh, deaths per year and then up to 1,000, they are often called then crisis situations or um, you know, violent crisis situations, but not yet mass atrocities. So, we can treat this definition as a working uh, definition. It has certain pluses um, and it has certain minuses. Um, the plus is uh, that it is not limited to war crimes and it is not limited to the cases of genocide. So that is the plus of this uh, definition. Um, the minus is that it does not include the undermining of living conditions. So people who are subject to forced migration, yeah? they would be, wouldn't be included into this definition because they are still alive. Or undermining the living conditions of people would not be included here in this definition of mass atrocities, even if they can't live uh, anymore at the place where they have, have been uh, doing so um, before that. Okay, so there are pluses and minuses with this uh, definition of, of mass atrocities. Um, what is in the task of early warning? Um, we, um, I think, have to assess the relative risks. So what are the indicators where we can uh, somehow determine um, there is a risk of mass atrocity? Um, we want to improve also the awareness of the public for these risks so that uh, the people might be prepared to react when uh, we know this is behind the horizon. And then um, we want to advance the understanding of early warning for mass atrocities. So one goal is also to improve our academic approaches. The basic dilemma with mass atrocities is that an event did not take place and people and politicians should react to an event that didn't take place. So usually we have only a CNN effect 
when the atrocity is already there. Why should we act to an event? Some people from academia predict, let's say, for Nigeria or for Myanmar, when this event didn't happen yet. So there are so many, you know, pressing issues that usually politicians and people say, why should we do something about something that didn't happen yet? And if, you know, early warning is success successful, the event does not happen. So you don't have any TV coverage of an event that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So successful pre prevention is no news at all. So this is the dilemma of early warning. Okay. Let's come now to a, a, a more uh, theoretical question. What do we talk about? What is violence about? Um, mass atrocities are part of violence. And there, one has to admit that the whole concept of violence, although many think I know what violence is, is very vague, very ambiguous. Um, the use of the term violence is very disputed and often we don't know whether we talk about violence, whether we talk about aggression, whether we talk of um, you know, a relationship between the subject and object of, of violence. And I will give you some examples. I thought a while uh, about the definition I like to give to you. Uh, I, I ended up with this: a form of human behavior which aims at a substantial infringement of the survival functions, the freedom of action, and the well-being of all sentient creatures. There are certain elements to this definition of violence. First, we have a subject of violence here. There is a perpetrator. There's an actor, there's agency. So it's not structural violence. We don't talk about you know, prerequisites of violence, and there's always an actor behind it. It's not anonymous structures. They might be conducive for violence, but the prerequisites, uh, prerequisites are not identical with violence. Second, um, it is an infringement of the survival functions and the freedom of action uh, on the developing of all sentient creatures, meaning it is not just pertaining to human beings. When we talk about violence, we talk about all those animals, including human beings, who have sentiments, who have emotions. So we talk about all those who can experience pain. Yeah. So therefore, it's a definition that is much broader than other uh, definitions of violence who say violence is happening between human beings. But we are not violent when we are physically you know, doing harm to animals. So in that sense, it's a much broader um, uh, definition. But when it comes to the subjects of violence, the big issue is here intention. The subject is defined by intention. So if we have a perpetrator, there must be an intention to commit a certain act of violence. So how do we prove the intention? So we could often have physical effects, for example, of natural disasters that are similar to acts of violence. But if when once we have natural disaster, we have no intention. Yeah? An earthquake, who is behind the earthquake? There is no intention of the subject behind that. So here, in this, uh, if we, we say we need intention, we have to prove that there is intention. We have to describe intention. There must be intentional behavior behind that and not an accident. So if I drive, for example, and by accident cause um, um, the death of, of a pedestrian, would people call that violence because there is death of a pedestrian? Without my intention, people would say maybe it was, um, you know, not very conscious behavior, but there was no intention. Uh, if we say, okay, only intentional behavior is called violence, we would exclude cases where there is no intention. Um, but the big problem is of, often also with mass atrocities, how do we prove the intention? And Perpetrators often say, this is collateral damage. It was not my intention to kill them. Or there was no order. 
or those who have committed uh, the crime say, no, it was not my personal intention, but it was the intention of those commanders, but not my own intention. So I, as a subject who committed the act of violence, I'm not responsible for the intention. Put the blame on somebody else. Then also the objects of violence, for example, are only animals, including human beings, the, sub the object of violence. So if we, for example, destroy this house here, people are living in this house, people could survive, but the destruction of the house, would that be called violence? Because the object of violence is not a human being, not an animal, but it is a physical structure. So we could say it somehow infringes upon the survival functions of human beings because a house might be the prerequisites for the survival of the human beings. So therefore, my definition is broader than just the infliction of harm to a human body. So therefore I say, if we undermine the living conditions of human beings, that is also part of violence and not just the physical attack on a body. Because the attack on the survival functions, including, for example, housing, is part of a violent act. Then we may ask, is intention always a necessary condition of violence? So there might be also uh, many deaths, but it was not the intention to kill them. Um, because the prime intention was a different one. Um, to what extent do we hold responsible perpetrators then when they have only limited intentions or when it was collateral damage? Yeah. So is this part then of the law of war that we say, okay, during war people die and therefore it is the overall context we have to uh, ascribe the results and consequences to? Or is there uh, do we need a direct um, intention? And also, is the commissioning of violence already violence? So if somebody, for example, commissions a murderer, he would be called a murderer even if the murder was not successful. Attempted murder or the commissioning of murder is called murder, even if the object of violence survived. Attempted murder is a crime. So even if the harm is not done, the intention is at times sufficient to call the crime a crime, even if no direct physical harm is done. Then the question about structural violence. Many talk about that and say, okay, Johann Galtung in the 1960s, a Norwegian peace researcher, introduced the notion of structural violence and say, in certain structures we have violence built in, even if we don't have intention or we can't blame any politicians for having you know, introduced the system. The system in itself is a structure of violence. Many disputes about that, for example, power inequalities, um, exclusion from participation in government and so on, um, poverty he calls structural violence. We may discuss this later on to what extent we can, uh, it makes sense to talk about structural violence. Uh, and many also think, you know, we should not include animals because there is a certain supremacy of human beings. Animals are not uh, the kings uh, on earth. We are, as human beings, the kings, and therefore we are entitled to do all kinds of mass atrocities against animals. When we do the same things we do with animals, we are mass murderers. Um, but when we do this with animals, you know, we are simply as godlike uh, human beings entitled to kill. We have a license to kill. And of course, uh, people who think you know animals have also rights, they question this built-in supremacy claim of human beings and say, no, animals have also all kinds of emotions. Why should they be treated differently? So why are we entitled to mass murder vis-a-vis -vis other animals, but only, you know, mass murder is delegitimized against 
let's say, civilians. Yeah. So what, what are the criteria for, for selecting the object here of violence? That is, the destruction of things is that also violence. So if you only attack, uh, let's say, a railway station, if you attack a house or something, or if you throw a stone or so, uh, is this already violence if, if you don't directly even uh, target um, a human being, but even this, tar this targeting does not undermine living conditions? Would we call that also violence? And then the final question is, is the omission also to act a form of violence? So, if you could help and you don't help, would we call that violence? If somebody drowns and you could help assist a child drowning in a sea and you don't assist, what would we call this? The omission to help. This is also violence. If we see, for example, mass atrocities happening and we don't do anything about this, are we acting violently simply by turning the other way around, by turning a blind eye to mass atrocities going on? What is our responsibility once we see atrocities going on? And are we also to blame for the omission to act? So is violent behavior also when you don't act? I simply want to say there are many questions you can raise when you deal with uh, the concept of violence. Uh, very intricate. Uh, okay, there are basically comprehensive and more narrow understandings of the concept of violence. Uh, the comprehensive one includes also psychic violence, psychological violence. So you do harm to somebody can do harm by, uh, you know, uh, inflicting harm on, on the psyche of a person without harming the body. Um, a comprehensive uh, definition would, would include here also the omission. Some people also call uh, talk about cultural violence. If you destroy the cultural symbols of a certain group, say, so, you know, this is part of violence. Uh, if you destroy, for example, a church, if you destroy other cultural artifacts, that is cultural violence. So it's part of a broader definition. Um, violence against objects and so on. The point here is with a comprehensive understanding of violence that um, you often lose track of the agency. Uh, so who is to be blamed if you have such a broad uh, understanding and you often mixed prerequisites of violence also with the outcomes. A very narrow one would focus only on physical violence. So there must be a perpetrator and there must be a clear victim. The problem with a very narrow understanding of violence is um, that the interaction between uh, perpetrators and victims um, is often left out as if there is always a clear distinction between who is the perpetrator and who is the victim. And often we have war situations where a perpetrator is a victim at the same time. So somebody shoots and somebody is shot at. So you are an actor and also a reactor at the same time. Okay. One. Um, oops. Okay. Key aspect um, in looking at violence is um, legitimacy. Because our whole view on violence is informed by how do we legitimize or delegitimize acts of violence. Because acts of violence don't count as violence if we think it is legitimate. So, for example, a policeman who holds a weapon, he is somehow seen as a legitimate actor. He is legitimized to show force. The same behavior done by a civilian is called a violent act. He will be punished. So the one is a legitimized you know, um, actor and the other one is a delegitimized one. So it always depends on the social acceptance of violence, whether a certain act is framed in a way that is criminal, 
or whether it is framed in a way where you say it is uh, uh, legal, it is not sanctioned, it has not to, to be sanctioned. Legitimization is a key function for participating in acts of violence. So only if you legitimize violence, um, the participation of groups is possible. You always need an improving narrative for participating in violence. And now I will show you certain for, uh, classical forms of legitimization for violence. So first is, I have good intentions. My violence is preventive, my violence is self-defense. I always do this to protect my own group. Self-defense is good, whether as, you know, the other is the aggressor. And as, as long as I defend myself as an, against an aggressor, I'm legitimate uh, in my actions. Okay? Then how independent is the deed? So my deed is only reacting to what some others have done or, or a, beforehand. Yeah? So it's just reactive violence. I, I'm forced to react in the same way. Then what always plays a large role in legitimization is the scope uh, of violence. Um, so if you target large groups, we talk about mass atrocities. Mass atrocities are not legitimate. If you target smaller groups, it seems more legitimate. If you target women, it's bad. If you target men, it's obviously more legitimate. If you target somebody in uniform, it's more legitimate than if you target somebody who is a civilian. If you target a kid, it is not legitimate. Um, but if you target uh, somebody who is beyond 18, it is more legitimate. So we have all kinds of legitimizing narratives that somehow um, you know, determine groups of, of, of objects of violence. Where you say, you know, in this case, it's more appropriate um, to target the group uh, than in the other one. So, um, we are very selective in, uh, you know, blaming actors for committing acts of violence and duration of violence. If it's short term, uh, maybe, you know, you don't have the CNN effect yet. If it's uh, a long term um, violence, then it might be called illegit uh, illeg illegitimate. Um, then also certain forms of violence are called uh, illegitimate. So, for example, torture, rape, genocide, um, um, also the public performance or public exposure of violence is, is an, called illegitimate. But if you do this in secret, it's less, you know, uh, offending. So, um, obviously, uh, uh, certain forms are, are called illegal or, or uh, Amoral, whether others not. Um, then also the symbolism of violence plays a huge role in saying you know it's legitimate or illegitimate. For example, destroying cultural symbols is often seen as illegitimate. Whereas you know if you if you destroy you know, a normal house, it would be seen as, as less offensive. Okay. I think there are out there three major explanations uh, for violence. The one is say um, the biological explanation. Um, it says, you know, violence is a function of frustration, um, aggression reacts to expectations, it's about sexual lust, it's about um, fear, it's about panic, it's about insecurity, it's about um, the role also of moderators like drugs, like alcohol. Um, so it's basically a biochemical reaction that goes on when you uh, when you act violently, and uh, all kinds of, of you know biologists have dealt with, with the aggression of animals, and some have tried to discern you know between the aggression of animals you know and, and the aggression of human beings. So you know um, maybe human beings are more violent than other animals because it is much more instrumental the aggression of, of animals than with human beings because there are more uh, preparatory acts. Uh, uh, animals don't moralize about aggression. They don't have legitimizing narratives or at least we don't know whether animals have legitimizing narratives when they commit mass murder. And, and it's always, you know, a, 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 a 
instrumental the violence, whereas you know uh, the violence of human beings has often to do with honor, with, with you know immaterial gains, uh, not just with material gains, uh, and so on. Um, and there's a lot of literature about that, about the interrelationship between aggression and violence. Then there is another strand of, of literature that deals with the actors of violence. They look at the social condition. They look at legitimizing narratives, they look at laws that make it possible uh, to act violently um, and so on. It's about the communication of violence, the language of violence, the prep uh, preparation, the linguistics of violence, the cultural preparation, the culture of violence, also then the group formation, the organization of actors of violence, the recruitment, the resources, who provides the weaponry. Um, who selects commanders and so on, how do you form groups and so on. This is all about the sociology of actors of violence. And also about the economic expectations, do I make profit by being violent? So uh, is this rational choice uh, actually is that you, violence is about achieving certain ends, is it the means to other ends? And so all these kind of theories deals with the logics um, of violent actors. And then we have a strand of literature that deals with opportunities. So which kind of context may, make it more likely that violence occurs? So uh, for example, political regimes, authoritarian regimes, the disintegration of societies, and also um, a normative decay in certain societies, transition countries seem to be uh, obviously very prone to violence, especially when you have one uh, the, the move from one system to the other and, and the in-between stages is more violent, especially elections are very violent. Then also state fragility, state capacity is a factor. So weak state capacity, fragile states are prone to violence. And then that you have also markets of violence. For example, if you have lootable um, you know, goods, uh, diamonds, gold, uh, um, gems uh, and so on. So if there's a lot to uh, of money to be made, um, and you have a market of violence. So, these different research agendas we deal with. And um, here I try to uh, come to, to potential causal explanations, and they are on different levels of abstractions. So, most of the quantitative studies out there they deal with the macro correlates of organized violence. So, they look at what are conditions that make the emergence of violence, especially also mass violence, mass atrocities, more likely. And here we have different theories, for example, the offensive and defensive, uh, the realist paradigm in international relations, we have the state failure paradigm, we have the paradigm of, of group factionalization, uh, ethnic heterogeneity, and all these kinds uh, of, of approaches that usually like to link risk factors with the likelihood of the emergence of, um, of um, mass atrocities. Then we have, um, let's say, enabling factors. They are a little bit down the ladder of, of abstraction. They look then also at the spread of small arms of, and light weapons, for example, um, at, at the international support for certain uh, actors of violence, of um, you know, um, the breakdown maybe of patronage and clientelistic systems like in Syria and so on. Then we have the literature that deals with onset conditions. So the two more abstract levels, they are you know, background, dealing with background conditions, but they usually don't say much when does it start. Can we predict with some likelihood when does it start and why does it start even if certain prerequisites are there. And so these um, studies, they look at, at mobilization and group formation, and then we have um, you know, the micro-sociology of violence that looks at the enactment of violence. What happens on the micro-level when uh, a perpetrator and a victim uh, come together? On the macro-level, I would say most explanations deal with greed, grievance, um, with um, uh, resources um, and um, the geography of violence, Whereas the micro uh, perspective on, on, on violence deals with incentives of actors, um, with the selection of victims, uh, why do you select certain victim groups, prefer them over others, and so on. 
and um, the microdynamics also deal with, with the interrelationship between violence and social order. Okay. Um, I want to show you now here um, the linkage between armed conflict and mass atrocities. So if we look at all those mass atrocities committed after 1945, uh, we see here that um, there is a strong link between wartime episodes and mass atrocities. So we see certain mass atrocities are committed also in peacetime, but most, especially since um, the 1960s, are committed in the context of wars. So we have either interstate wars or internal wars, some call them civil wars, and mass atrocities are part of warfare. But, nonetheless, certain are also uh, outside the context of warfare. So, this is here a chart that I took from Alex Badali from the Stanley Foundation, so this one is not my own. And he says, you know, um, that 67% of all major cases of mass atrocities occurred in the context of armed conflict and 33 outside the context of, um, of uh, armed conflict. So there is obviously a very strong um, linkage between conflict, armed conflict and mass atrocities, but it is not confined to that uh, in general. Okay. Question then is, what kind of escalation patterns we may discern. How do we discern, discern that there is um, a path that may lead to mass atrocities? There is always some precursor violence. There is some low intensity warfare that may end up in, uh, in, in uh, large scale warfare or in mass atrocities. So, um, violent demonstrations, pogroms, um, uh, attacks on symbols of other groups might be precursors to mass atrocities, and only the mass atrocities are an end point of a certain escalation uh, pattern. What is necessary is that the group that perpetrates violence, mass violence, is in a status of fear. If we don't act first, we will be the victim ourselves. You have to instill a sense of panic and fear in the group that perpetrates mass atrocities. So we always see then also the rumors spreading about the other group that already committed certain acts of violence, usually rape, sexual violence, and in former Yugoslavia, for example, I saw videos um, where the violence was not there yet, but the videos were there about the um, sexual violence committed by members of the other group. So you instill a sense of panic in a group and say, you know, if we don't act first, they will do that to us. And rumors play therefore a very crucial role in preparing a group for acting as a perpetrator. So the breakdown of normal mass communication is a very good indicator for something that's looming behind the horizon. The spread of rumors. Rumors where you don't you know, validate information anymore if you take them at face value and you look, we have this sexual connotation to what the other side is doing. They are raping our wives, they are raping our children, they are raping also men and then we have to act. So rumors was a sexual undertone are an indicator for something is looming behind the horizon. You have to homogenize your own group and you have to polarize um, the group or, or antagonize the other group. So you have to dehumanize the other group. The other group should be treated as an animal, as insects, as parasites. You, know, you have to somehow denigrate the other group in order to overcome any obstacle, moral obstacle, to kill the other group. So treat the other group as subhumans and makes it easier to kill them as if they are cows or if they are pigs. We are morally not inhibited, many of us, to kill cows, to kill pigs and to other, kill other animals. 
So therefore you have to level the group to other animals and then you are able morally um, to kill them. You have to de-individualize them also. Each individual representative of the other group should be a representative of the group, of the collective, no longer an individual. He's only a Serb, a Pole, a, a Ukrainian, a Russian, so you don't take them anymore individually, but you kill them as representatives um, of the group. You often have preparatory, uh, preparatory rituals in the escalation pattern, so the greeting of flags, taking an oath, the public mourning, and so on. Often before mass violence happens, you have certain rituals where groups prepare in a symbolic manner for acts of violence. Then you have to form the groups because mass atrocities are committed by groups. It's not individuals. I mean, you can drop an atomic bomb, but most of the mass atrocities are committed by groups. So these groups have to be organized. There must be a commander, there must be a group structure, there must be lines of command. The perpetrators might, should know whom to, uh, uh, whose orders to follow. You have to select the victims. Um, because not all victims might be in reach. So the victims that you are likely to kill, they must be an object of frustration. So at, at times, you, uh, we see also mass atrocities, atrocities a selection of scapegoats, because you can't reach the group you like to kill, and therefore you go for another group, because it's a very good scapegoat, or it is a source of frustration. But the group that you attack should be weak, it should be easily targeted. So you don't go for groups that are much stronger than yourself. And then you see also a progression in this violence. Okay, let me come now to the point what kind of um, early warning methods do we have. Um, we can assess risks, we can forecast, forecast based on um, marriage electoral correlates and say okay, if we have the following poverty rate, we have in inequality, we have um, certain degrees of, let's say, um, organization of literacy. We can create all kinds of correlates between uh, uh, you know, uh, context and, and the likelihood that, that violence occurred. We can do expert forecasting. We can ask focus groups how do you assess the situation. We can do can do also crowd forecasting that we ask people especially over the internet or over social media. How do we assess a certain situation? And we can have qualitative country reports, like for example from the International Crisis Group. I would like to present now two um, projects that are out there, one Swedish one and one um, American one from the Holocaust Memorial Museum, and they do different things. So first about the project views which is called Violence Early Warning System. It's by, headed by the Uppsala University and they have uh, finances from the Horizon 2020 uh, uh, European Union um, funding scheme and they use data from Sub-Saharan Africa on three types of conflict, state-based conflict, one-sided violence against civilians and non-state conflict, that they try to predict for three years the likelihood of mass atrocities but not only mass atrocities, um, uh, different forms of violent conflicts with more than 25 uh, deaths per year. So it's not just about the prediction of, of uh, mass atrocities. And um, they um, take all kinds of, e of events from the past and say, you know, here uh, we had uh, violent incidents and then try to relate these violent incidents to a certain uh, input factors. What kind of input factors look, do, they, uh, do they look at? Um, they look at the conflict history. For example, um, it's a history of prior violence. And um, is this protracted violence or do we see a certain decay, decline in violence? And try to link it then to the likelihood that new uh, violence occurs. They look at demography, for example, the population side, they look at uh, the, the, the number of young people, the so-called youth bulge, they look at um, the level of education, they look at um, the percentage share of urban population, they look at the economy, um, the gross domestic product per capita, 
they look at um, oil rents, whether this resource purse government uh, fits in here, whether it is you know, about looting, about economic incentives for violence. Um, they look at institutions, for example, is this a democratic country, is it an authoritarian country, um, how many uh, uh, people representing minority groups are included in government or excluded. They look at protests, um, do we have an increase or decrease of, of protests here. They look at uh, the natural geography, for example, mountainous or flat area. They look at social geography. For example, so distances to travel, um, roads, and so on, these kind of, of factors. And they try to combine all these correlates of violence and uh, what they came up with is um, that um, no single explanation or single correlation is good in predicting, but the combination of the different um, correlates of violence or correlates of war um, um, adds value. Uh, so it is the combination of all these factors that makes it more likely that um, you can foresee in a period from uh, uh, over 36 uh, months that, that something is, is likely to happen. Okay. Um, the Holocaust Memorial Museum has a different uh, set of risk factors. They look at, at um, Basic, basic country characteristics. They also look at social economic measures, at ethnic factionalization, at infant mortality, also at the GDP, at the regime time, and so on, and also at whether mass killings are ongoing, and so on, and repression of society, um, civil society. Um, what are the shortcomings of these kinds of you know, correlates of violence um, predictions. Um, often it is assumed that these uh, conducive conditions, conditions are causal, but we don't know whether they are actually causal. We say, can say, okay, there are certain conditions that make it more likely, but it doesn't explain causality yet. Um, often very diverse events are lumped together. So you might have a demonstration that turned violent. Um, you have maybe throughout the country 25 death, but you have then also mass atrocities, and all these events are somehow taken together, and we don't have enough differentiation between different types of violence, and also often the different types of groups that commit violence also treated um, equally. Okay. I also see that um, there is an assumption as if structures overdetermine violence, if you look at these correlates of war, as if there is a kind of structural overdetermination, um, somehow uh, disrespecting the importance of agency. Often we also see that as a juxtaposition of state versus non state actors. But if you look at all the mass atrocities committed after World War II, most of the mass atrocities were committed by state actors and not by non-state actors. So what does the differentiation between, let's say, regular and irregular armed groups help us in understanding the causes of mass atrocities? Because in the end, they often uh, actually um, cooperate and collate the state and non-state actors. Okay. Now a chart that looks at um, um, mass killings uh, after 1989. The positive thing is we see overall a decline over the last 30 years. So um, we had a certain peak in the early 1990s. Um, maybe the great powers didn't have this restraining rule anymore on their satellites. They felt now we can do and act without you know, the control of this, by the Soviet Union or the control by the United States. Um, we see um, also here a uh, decrease of um, um, the uh, onset of mass killings by state, um, but we see a slight increase um, of the onset of mass killings by non state actors. Now, I'm coming already uh, short of the close. Um, 
We see the results for 2018 and 2019, the forecasts by the project funded by the Holocaust Memorial Museum and by Professor Valentin for Dartmouth College in the United States who collaborated closely with the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, what did they predict? They said now in 2018 and 2019 it's likely to have mass killings in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Afghanistan, Egypt, South Sudan, Pakistan and Yemen. We see a strong overlap between ongoing violent conflicts and the prediction. Okay. So, um, what is interesting here that if we look at focus group expert uh, uh, surveys and the predictions based on the correlates, um, where you take all these uh, statistical input factors, that um, the expert comparisons and also at times the crowd prediction is better than the academic prediction of mass atrocities. So, experts obviously often have a very or a better sense of an atrocity looming behind the horizon and people also living in certain areas have a better sense there is something looming behind the horizon than taking all these indicators that I've spoken about beforehand can predict. So in the end the question is then which kind of model should we use for predicting mass atrocities? Should we go for all these statistical analysis and try to predict violence over the next three years? Or should we ask as experts and should we do crowd uh, uh, or soliciting the opinions of, of crowds uh, over social media? I think in the end, uh, it makes only sense to look at those models who don't overlook cases of mass atrocities. For example, Myanmar was not predicted in 2016 by many models. So something is wrong, obviously. If you don't foresee certain cases, the killing of the Rohingyas in, our, uh, in, in, in the north of Myanmar was not predicted. Although some NGOs said, um, Human Rights Watch, Watch Genocide Alert said, um, it's likely to happen. So maybe we should then go, if we like, to prevent and early warn about mass atrocities for those models or for those groups are, who are better in warning us. And the experts forecasting and the crowd forecasting is astonishingly accurate even compared to the very sophisticated model which I presented here uh, from, from Uppsala University. A political implication is that if we look at uh, cases like Libya, if we look at, at, at cases like um, Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, that we at times from the West supported regime change in favor of democracy. He said, you know, we have to get rid of the dictator like Gaddafi, Assad, uh, the military in Myanmar. Uh, but the result of regime change is state fragility, um, state collapse, disorder, and we have as a result of regime change, not democracy, but very favorable conditions for committing uh, mass atrocities. So we have to make a choice. What is our priority? Saving lives or saving democracy? And at times you have to say maybe saving lives is more important than promoting democracy. At least promotion of democracy is not worth mass atrocities. I think that is one political lesson. We have to do much more about constant, regular monitoring in all these countries and not just at the moment when atrocities occur. We have to do much more about protection of people that are affected by mass atrocities. No-flight zones, for example, preventing um, bombing. 
same zones were first introduced in Bosnia-Herzegovina, failed in 1995. Srebrenica um, uh, happened in Bosnia-Herzegovina despite the existence of a UN safe zone. In Syria, many talked about safe zones, but safe zones were never introduced. So we have to think about how to build. I think we have to think about uh, alternatives to the UN Security Council. If we don't get the approval by all five members, should we simply watch and see and say we can't do anything about it? In the case of Ukraine, for example, no consensus was, what we, uh, was found, but the Normandy format was uh, somehow invented um, by uh, a small group of countries um, who said at least we have to stop the war in the Donbass and we have to um, somehow observe the ceasefire, ceasefire and, and, and you know, implement an uh, OC, uh, OC observer mission. Um, we may also at the time think about um, equipping and uh, training protectors. For example, like in the case of the Peshmerga in um, Iraq, uh, who protected uh, the Jesuits uh, fleeing from Syria, but also in Iraq. Um, so there was no international intervention. But Germany, for example, armed Kurdish Peshmergas because they protected civilians that were targeted by um, ISIS. No, no intervention, no resolution by the UN Security Council, but human lives were saved by arming and training Kurdish Peshmergas. Could be a possibility, of course, we have the problem with um, how do you control Peshmergas? How do, where do these weapons end up? Um, we have also to think about whether uh, we, we form units in our governments and our national governments on uh, uh, fighting war crimes so that we collect in our governments all information, um, including um, information by uh, secret services that we somehow uh, bring all these information together um, in order to, to enable the governments uh, to have uh, professional early warning and also to support NGOs that do reporting but often have not enough um, uh, finances to do so. Um, the idea is here uh, maybe to, to build up atrocity prevention boards that don't deal with the crisis management but deal with the prediction and the early warning um, and say, you know, these kind of resources we will have to mobilize before the crisis is there. And um, something like that could also be formed on the level of the European Union, so that uh, the European Union uh, has a kind of atrocity prevention board where the information uh, of all the national secret services is brought together and a kind of early action mechanism is established. Thanks very much. Thanks for your attention.
have made this decision, uh, okay, or, or yeah, made this decision on the general assembly, not at the Security Council. And do, do, you, do you know anything else? What is what is going on now, and what, where is this, this case at the moment? I think that is the only way out currently that the UN General Assembly um, adopts a resolution and provides finances for inquiry commissions, um, reports back to the General Assembly. And in this case, I have to say, yes, um, a couple of countries, including Germany, financed this inquiry commission, which got amended from the General Assembly, but not from the UN Security Council. And this is a possibility to undermine the blocking of inquiries by Russia or China uh, in the uh, UN Security Council. So we have um, somehow to disempower the veto uh, power of, of uh, the permanent five members in the UN Security Council and to empower the General Assembly. Because otherwise this whole policy of denial, of uh, denying access, of, you know, I mean, the Russians always said, you know, no chemical weapons, uh, and then half a year later, they, um, they, uh, I mean, this UN commission came up with a report uh, saying, you know, we have enough evidence that chemical weapons were used uh, um, by the Syrian government and even maybe with the protection by, uh, you know, um, uh, Russian jet fighters. But they felt, you know, half a year is gone, it's out of the news, people have forgotten about it, and so on. But as the, sorry, as the member of the UN Security Council, does the Russian Federation have a right to, uh, to veto anything from the General Assembly, this kind of decisions? Because no, no, they can't veto a resolution by the General Assembly. The point is simply that countries have to provide money for any kind of inquiry commission that gets amended from the General Assembly. So and in that case, I don't recall the exact uh, number of countries that supported this resolution, but it was an overwhelming, I would say, close to two-third majority who said, you know, um, Russia is blocking in the UN Security Council. We are in favor of this inquiry nonetheless. And some countries gave a um, significant amount of money uh, for, for, uh, for this inquiry uh, commission including Germany. I have to praise my country in that case that they uh, played a substantial role in, in financing the, the mission. But we need this on a much more permanent basis um, than just, you know, in certain specific cases where you say, you know, we have this particular incident, we need this monitoring more regularly for many years and not just a particular you know, case where you had um, the use of chemical weapons, for example. Thank you for your lecture. And I'd like to ask you to question about your thoughts on the possibility of mass atrocities towards Kurds in Syria. Because according to recent reports, there are some observations about the possibilities that the Turkish government is playing uh, mass atrocities, not just against Kurds on their own territory, but mostly against the Kurds on the territory of, um, of Syria. And I'd like to know your opinion and whether um, you believe that there is a high possibility uh, of such thing, and uh, um, what, whether uh, the international community, UN, and other organizations uh, will have the capacity and uh, you know, foresight or will to, um, to do some actions uh, to prevent such thing. Thanks. I mean, the Turks, the Turkish army already began uh, in January last year to invade um, Afrin, the area of Afrin in North Syria, uh, attacking not just positions of the YPG but also civilians. Um, we don't have much reporting about that. Um, Personally, I think um, there are maybe 
two or three ways to react to what the Turks are doing. And I've published what I'm saying now. Um, the first was, I said, um, Turkey is basically uh, violating the basic principles of its NATO membership. And we should, should suspend NATO membership of Turkey, even if there is no special article on kicking the country out of NATO. But if one country could ask, you know, the suspension or the um, of, of the membership or a change of the treaty of NATO. So I was asking for Germany to ask uh, to, to, to change the status of, uh, of Turkey inside NATO. So that would simply say, you know, we don't side with the NATO member uh, Turkey in, in the way they uh, conduct their warfare um, in, in Syria because it's against international law in our understanding. And we don't want to be pulled into a war conducted by Turkey in Syria because um, it is even dangerous for other NATO countries. Because if Turkey then asks to defend our interests as being a NATO member in Syria, we could be pulled in, into a war, dirty war conducted by Turkey in Syria. So that's number one. Uh, the second is um, the European Union um, concluded in late 2015 a treaty with Turkey over um, refugees coming from Turkey, uh, from Syria. Um, Turkey gets billions of euro um, for somehow protecting the European Union from uh, migrants or refugees coming from Syria. Um, a lot of this money is actually misused, not for purposes for refugees protecting, but it's a money-making machine also for the Turkish uh, government. But second, we are somehow hostage um, to Turkey's policy because on one hand it produces refugees and then it is even paid for the refugees. So it's a very dirty deal. And I would say um, that if we uh, don't uh, provide Turkey anymore with these billions of, I think altogether 6 billion euro, um, if we simply say, okay, that was an imminent situation in 2015 to stop the mass migration from Syria, but we no longer provide money for Turkey. Turkey would understand um, we, there's an economic punishment for that. And the third, as in the case of um, the use of chemical weapons by the Syrian government, we could also ask um, that somebody initials a resolution and the General Assembly of uh, United Nations says, you know, um, we want to have an inquiry commission mandated by the General Assembly um, that keeps record of what Turkey is doing and we will report both to the International Criminal Court of Justice and to the UN General Assembly with the findings of this commission. That will expose Turkey's behavior in the Afrin region in Syria. Maybe if I would allow just to ask a question, which I think is on many people's mind, is what does your research imply for the violence that occurred on Crimea and in the Donbass? Maybe you could reflect on this a little bit since we are here in Ukraine. How much this sort of, uh, whether you can sort of comment in the line of what you said, on, especially on the Donbass. What is striking for the audience outside Ukraine, especially in EU countries, is that this whole conflict here in Ukraine is somehow treated uh, as if it is a geopolitical a political conflict, as if it is you know, about US versus Russia, EU versus Russia, Ukraine, pulled apart between Russia and the EU as if, uh, you know, we have no victims as if, and the victims of this war, uh, of the violence in Crimea and in the Donbass are by and large invisible. They're not part of the report. And even the OCE uh, reports about the violations of the ceasefire but it doesn't violate about a uh, report to the same extent about the human sufferings of this war. So if you look at the daily reports, and I receive them every day by the OSCE observer mission, 
It is about the violations of the ceasefire. But it is not about the effects of the violation of ceasefire. It is only we recorded the following violations. But it's not about you know the human sufferings, and I think in that sense uh, the mandate has to be expanded because it would put much more moral pressure on the perpetrators of this violence. They would be much more exposed. So we have basically an act of violence, but we have no naming, blaming, shaming as a result of the observer mission. <coughs> we don't have a lot of CNN effect as a result of the OC mission. That would be, in my understanding, one of the consequences to be drawn from that. And the second is, um, we need, in all these kinds of um, situations where mass atrocities or mass killings or mass deportations are committed, much more technical equipment for reporting. And the technical possibilities are out there. For example, drones, for example, satellites. For example, all this kind of imagery that if it would end up every day on our TV screens, there would be much more exposure. And the technical means are out there. But if you look, for example, at the technical equipment of the OSC mission here in Ukraine, it's miserable. It's miserable. We could have much more reporting if we use all these, you know, um, permanent cameras, permanent microphones, permanent, you know, drones that overfly everything, any kind of military movement would be recorded and we have to invest much more into that in order to undermine this attempt to deny uh, responsibility. The deniability is what, what the Russians did in Syria, what the Russians did in the Donbass, always denying, declaring it fake news. And that is part of the game. Um, sir, um, going back to a question to Syria, I have a good question about terrorism and actors and uh, how do you see terrorism and the mass atrocities because the intention is to kill uh, as much people uh, as terrorists can do. But uh, the other problem is with ISIS is that there is a lot of people around the world that's going, okay, I'm for ISIS and I will do it for ISIS. So it's not, it's, there is a problem of actor who is doing it and who is inspired. And uh, the second question is also for actor. Uh, uh, of course, you know the case of Hutu and Tutsi in Africa. And so it was, um, as I understood, it was a uh, authority inspired hate between two, uh, two peoples. So, uh, what is the um, uh, responsibility for uh, authority in this case? Because uh, the actions were done by ordinary people. Acts of violence. Um, you probably know what the saying that uh, uh, rebels are for one group, freedom fighters, for others, they are terrorists. So, uh, this is always part of the legitimizing or delegitimizing narrative, whether you call a certain group of perpetrators terrorists and whether you call certain acts of violence terrorist acts. Uh, so uh, often the same act can be labeled um, in one way or the other. Um, and who, who is going to label that? You know, I, for example, went to Kosovo in 1999. Um, in 1998, um, the Kosovo Liberation Army was still on the list of terrorist organizations. And in uh, late summer 1998, the United States government, uh, under Albright um, Foreign Ministry or uh, the State Department, declared um, they are now uh, allies of, of the United States. So you at times see also switches. You know, a group is called for a time because they are now our bodies against the joint enemy and then they are no longer uh, treated as terrorists. Um, so, I find it difficult uh, to be picky about certain groups uh, labeled terrorists whereas others are not labeled terrorists. Often um, groups are not homogeneous. 
Um, uh, I think there are not clear-cut divides between good and bad uh, uh, groups. Uh, some may commit acts uh, against civilians in order to instill awe and shock and so on and call them and also terrorists. But um, often you have different incentives inside the group. It's not homogeneous. And to, uh, from the perspective of conflict transformation, I think in all kinds of groups, we have to see what is the mix of incentives. Why did people join? Was it an economic motive? Was it social pressure? Was it, you know, forced recruitment? At times you have also forced recruitment of child soldiers, or, you know, you have sex laborers. How many people in ISIS, you know, women were, uh, you know, recruited as the prostitutes of ISIS in Central Asia, for example, um, who had no clue where they would end up. They came from uh, the Fagana Valley in Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan and ended up, I mean hundreds, we talk about hundreds of, of young women who ended up in Syria uh, fighting together or doing certain services for ISIS. Um, and you ask yourself, were they terrorists or were they simply unemployed, were they simply, you know, without any perspective? And at times it's hard to say, you know, um, this is a die-hard terrorist. And so therefore, I, my, my hunch would be look at um, these actors also as human beings and what as a possibility to transform them maybe even with the perspective to reintegrate them because usually the labeling as terrorist means you know um, there are no politics you can't negotiate you can't bargain with terrorists and that was the attitude for example vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban also in Afghanistan for so it failed for 20 years, and now we talk about bargaining, negotiating with the Taliban. Because we don't label them anymore terrorists, because we need them for peace. We can't kill them, so we need to you know, make them to partners for peace. So that is my answer to your first question. Look at the mix of motivations and that they also may change over time. With respect to the Rwanda Hutu Tutsi issue, um, of course we had mass, mass participation in, in the genocide. Um, you could say uh, it was a violent society. It was not only a state actress, but um, it would be on the other hand also an exaggeration to say. Um, that the Hutus killed the Tutsi in Rwanda simply because there was eternal hatred. Um, there were um, paramilitary groups um, who participated in the killing, um, who got funding from the government, who were recruited by the government, even if the weapons were you know, simple weapons. Um, you know, it was not you know, industrial killing in, in Rwanda. It was, all done by hand usually. You know, uh, uh, it was physical killing, not uh, with distant uh, weapons. You know, that, that, that killed on distance. Not only that, there was a lot of organization, there was a lot of preparation. There was uh, preparation through the media, through radio stations, through TV stations, and then whatever I said about you know polarizing the groups. Um, there were many steps preparatory steps before the actual killing took place. So um, uh, you can't say this was a non-state um, mass atrocity. It was the intermingling in Rwanda of state actors and non-state actors. And I would say the problem of collective action could only be resolved also in Rwanda with the active participation of state actors. I have a question regarding um, this predictive analysis, like mm -hmm. predictive institutions. Like you mentioned, we have made them uh, like very successful in what they are doing, so their predictions are very good. And as you mentioned, we see the country X is coming top uh, mm -hmm. in this list. 
What's happening next? I mean, uh, whose responsibility, international community or the state itself should do something? How to prevent actual crisis happening? Mm -hmm. So like, I'm interested in me matching mechanism, how you see this. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, often nothing happens. Um, I mean, ask your question also a couple of times to uh, different members of our government over, I would say, in the last 10 to 12 years. I say, you know, um, we have annual country reports prepared by one institute in Germany in Hamburg. Uh, and I say, okay, uh, this country is on red, and this other one is on orange, on alert, and the other one is the green one. First, most of the countries that are in a like, crisis prone situation, risk countries, are somewhere between orange and red. So you don't know whether they are still orange uh, or whether they are already red. So what do you do in that situation where you say, okay, it's a risk country, high risk country, but what to do about this? So should we pull our people out? Let's, should we somehow evacuate embassies? Should we say, you know, to the business community, stop investing there because um, uh, mass atrocities are looming behind the horizon. Um, should we reinvest? Should we invest in investigations? Um, should we put money into these countries? And, and to whom should we give the money then? Uh, so, for example, in the case of South Sudan, yeah, we had the comprehensive peace agreement. Some people said, okay, um, maybe it's not stable, the comprehensive peace agreement. Uh, so it was ever more money poured into South Sudan. So there was a reaction to the red flag. But it became a business in its own. Because all actors of violence understood we are a red flag country, money is flowing. So it became a business in its own right to be constantly a country that is on alert. And money was poured into, and uh, it is too big to fail. So um, a kind of peace industry, a peace business uh, set in, and uh, even actors of violence you know, made money out of being on alert. For example, money was poured into demobilization of combatants. Or we have to demobilize the actors of violence. We do this in the Central African Republic, we do this in South Sudan, we do this in Congo Brazzaville, we do this in Liberia. So the basic money has to go to those potential actors of violence. What is the perverse effect then also of early warning is that produce, you produce ever more combatants. I was, for example, in December last year asked to go to the Central African Republic to do an assessment for the United Nations about the effectiveness of demobilization and reintegration programs. Early warning, early action. As a result of early warning, we have twice as many combatants now in the Central African Republic than at the moment when the early warning set in. Because everybody understood the more combatants I produce, the more money I will get for demobilization. So any group commander said, you know, in the beginning he had maybe 5,000 under his command. And he said, oh, we have World Bank money, UN money flowing in. I have 20,000. I have to feed 20,000. And if I don't feed 20,000, they are on the loose. So they will begin to shoot. So next commander understood, oh, he was very successful in feeding his own people. He don't have to loot anymore. He gets the money directly from the World Bank, directly from the United Nations, directly from the German government or the Japanese government. So at times you have perverse effects of early warning too. And be aware, people on the ground, they understand the political economy of conflict behavior. They also understand we can take Western governments as hostages because they are so scared about escalation, they will pour all kinds of money in and it's early warning and money-making machine. So we have to be much more aware about 
what are the effects and also of our early action uh, mechanism because people are not stupid. They understand there is a peace building industry, there's a hell of a lot of money flowing into countries like South Sudan, too big to fail, Yemen too big to fail, so therefore Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, nobody talks about Afghanistan anymore. Yeah. Too big to fail. So we have then also to look what is the outcome of our inputs and whether we have counterintuitive effects of our early action. And what kind of control do we have over this? Do we evaluate that? Because we have also, I mean, 16 different sub-organizations of the United Nations deal with conflict prevention. And they all have to feed diplomats, they all have to feed people. There's a hell of a lot of business involved already in um, you know, conflict prevention. And they don't want to lose. None of these sub-organizations want to lose people and money. Can't be in the um, cyberspace like an autonomous sphere of violence. So, uh, can we assess it not like a uh, mm -hmm. set of possible means of. Uh, yeah, okay, the question I understood. Uh, some people talk about cyber war. Mm. Uh, we don't know whether we can call this war or whether this is just a label, a scandalizing label. But if you say, okay, um, what is happening in the cybersphere undermines living conditions, uh, the way we live, and has serious, uh, serious impact on our lives, for example, undermining the functioning of hospitals, undermining the functioning of nuclear power plants, undermining the functioning of the electricity grid, undermining the functioning of the railway system, undermining the functioning, let's say, of um, air control. Yeah. So we could say it's a form of violence, even if there is no direct physical harm done to a person, but indirectly it is undermining substantially living conditions. So therefore, I would expand the understanding of violence also to what is going on, or potentially is going on, in the cybersphere. I'm not as uh, siding with those who call it already war, um, because war has also certain implications. If somebody conducts a war, it's a form of aggression that allows you to counteract. So if somebody launches a war, uh, he or she is an aggressor and you are entitled to counterattack. So if we call, let's say, Russia's um, behavior in the cybersphere a war, a cyber war, we could either react in kind or we could react with a whole range of other military means available. And that opens up a whole new set of questions if we call it war, um, do the laws of war apply then also to our counter reactions? So maybe we should call it cyber violence and not yet cyber war. Um, there are almost no laws or regulations, uh, not to talk about arms control in the cybersphere. And so uh, there is one area where I think arms control or let's say confidence building measures should take place in this area of cyber activities. But it is a whole new area where you can uh, do massive harm. We have certain regulations about what you can do with atomic weapons, you know, at least certain regulations breaking down currently too with the INF Treaty. Um, and we don't know in two years what happens to the START Treaty. But we have no regulations at all with respect to cyber activities.